You are now listening to Chakras and Shotguns. Welcome back to Chakras and Shotguns, episode 21. I'm Jen. And I'm Mick. Welcome back. How are you? You know, I'm doing good. Um, excited as we continue to um, just get some more support on the Patreon that we started. Um, yes. You know, we, we've we gotten a lot of love on social media. Um, you know, it's been, it's been great to just see all of that, that support um, expressed for us. And, um, you know, we spent a lot of time thinking about how we could you know, build a community with our listeners um, while also kind of giving them an opportunity to support the show. Um, and so we decided to launch a Patreon um, and we have bonus content, um, merch discounts, and we'll be announcing some uh, quarterly events as well as a part of that. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So this is um, this is just the beginning Um of like what we're doing outside of the show, we have some really, really, really amazing things that we want to do and that we think about and that we brainstorm about. So we really want to bring those things to fruition or if you want to get all hippy dippy, bring them into this dimension. So your support could be a huge part of that and it would really mean the world to us. So if that's something that you might be interested in, we have a link on our website, shockersandshotguns.com. Um, all right. So I know we have a action packed episode today. Pew, 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 pew. Tons of information we want to cover. So um let's jump into the breadth work um before we get into that. All right. So everyone, please find a comfortable seat and let's begin by connecting with our breath. So take a deep breath in through your nose, expanding your belly and sigh it out through your mouth. Let's do that again. A deep breath in through your nose Expanding your belly. Take in one more juicy bit of air and sigh it out through your mouth. Last one together. Let's take a deep breath in through the nose. And this time we're going to exhale through the nose. So now that we're aware of our breath, we're going to do a full body scan. And so we're just going to practice a little bit of awareness of our physical body. So without moving, I want you to focus your attention to your toes. If you're laying down, Feel where your calf muscles are meeting the earth. How do your knees feel? If you're sitting in a chair, feel your thighs as they meet your seat. Keep going up your body and check in. See what feels stiff, what feels like it needs some movement, it needs some TLC. Is your lower back hurting from sitting in your office chair all day? Breathe into those spaces that might need a little love today that might be overlooked as we're hustling from thing to thing, errand to errand, email to email. You should probably be around your solar plexus, so right above your ribcage, 
or below your ribcage. Moving up into your chest. Does your chest feel tight? What are you holding there? Is it stress? Worry? Moving up to your throat. And we'll finish at the top. And how does our head feel? Were we able to check in for these moments? Or are we thinking about something else already? And that's okay. Just bring yourself back to your breath. And thank yourself for taking this time to check in with the body that carries you from moment to moment and day to day. All right, let's continue on with the show. All right. Thanks so much, Jen. That was that was great. Um, I feel a little bit like I'm ready for bed, so I'm going to have to wake myself up <laughs> so we can finish recording this. But that was great. Um, very relaxing. Um, let's jump into the main topic. Yes. And just quickly, I wanted to do that body scan exercise because while that's about being physically aware of your body, This episode and what we're going to talk about today is about self-awareness, about who you are as a person. So, you know, we're doing, you know, mind, body, spirit, you know, how we do. Nice, nice. All right. So let's um, let's jump into it. Yeah. Yeah. So today we're diving into the Enneagram of personality, more commonly known as just the Enneagram. It was one of the first type finding systems that we got into um, a little bit before the spiritual journey. I actually kept seeing it on different blogs that I follow. Shout out to the everygirl.com, which was one of my faves. Um, And they had like a lot of clickbaity titles, like why you should know your Enneagram type, how to parent as your Enneagram type, what shack it should you buy for the fall based on your Enneagram type and so I was like what is this now I love even like before this right like I loved Myers-Briggs I love like all the different personalities tests even though side note Myers-Briggs is racist but that's neither here nor there um look it up but <laughs> um I kept looking into it it probably wasn't a coincidence looking back on it but Once I got into it and I really figured out my number, then I wanted to know mixed number. I wanted to know my mama's number, my daddy's number. I was psychoanalyzing everybody around me. Um, I actually even brought it up in therapy because it was helping me kind of discover some things. And I thought it was going to be really weird. This is also a testament to like finding the therapist that works for you. And I told her about it. She was like, um, I love the Enneagram. It's amazing. And like she had handouts for me and it was a beautiful moment. So it's something that Mick and I think is really cool and it's just another way to better understand each other. Like, and not just like in a couple, but just like better understand the people around us. So Mick, I said all of that to say, what the hell is the Enneagram? (laughs) Yeah, um, it's interesting. We actually got that question from folks who heard our trailer and our first episode because we talked about the fact that I'm an Enneagram 6 Jen's Enneagram 9, and folks were like, well, what is that? Where can I find more information about it? So for those folks, today is the day we dive more into it and talk a little bit about the Enneagram. So the Enneagram is a model of the human psyche uh, through nine interconnected personality types. Each person has a main or core number that has certain characteristics. So there's both light and dark uh, in different ways that they handle conflict, which are a part of that main number. Um, the, the history of the Enneagram is kind of tricky to, to pin down. It's kind of like an amalgamation of different pieces of knowledge from throughout history. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about that. To understand the history, you have to understand that the Enneagram is a symbol as well as a personality system. The symbol is a circle that has nine different points and a crisscross of lines going every which way that connects the points in a specific pattern. Um, you can pull up the show notes or do a quick Google to see the symbol. Sometimes the symbol freaks people out. 
people think it's like some uh what is what was that movie? The craft. Mm. Like they think it's like some pinnacle what's pentagram, occult yeah. stuff, but it's just a symbol and it shows like how the personality types work with each other. Um yeah, so no one really knows where the symbol actually came from, right? Um it's believed to have shown up around 2500 BC in Babylon. And you know, that's interesting if you remember from our episode on the big three of astrology we talked about how some of the earliest records of the zodiac were also found back in babylon um my theory is that you know everything wasn't just like originating in babylon i think they just had like the best file cabinets in the game like (laughs) they survived time the best um so you know that's just what i think um so anyway the, the symbol shares ideas with a lot of philosophers and religions um, the theories kind of underlying the symbol have been linked to Pythagoras, who you know created the, the Pythagorean theorem, which we all learned in, in grade school. Um, Plato, as well as Hermetic, Gnostic, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim philosophers. I just want to say that Mick pointing out that Babylon had the best file cabinets like is hilarious to me because when we first moved into like our first real home, and I like wanted to do my Pinterest board for our shared office space. Mick was like, no, I need a desk now. I need a file cabinet for my files. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this dude is crazy. Um, So, yeah, I just wanted to offer up that fun story about Mick. He does not play about his file cabinets. I got to have everything secure and know where everything is, all my records and whatnot. You know, it's a sixth thing. We'll we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. Uh, So so fast forward. uh, And there's this dude, uh, George Gurdjieff. Hopefully I didn't uh, mispronounce his name, you know, RIP to the to the homie there. Um, he, back in uh, 19th century, like early 20th century, he traveled all around the world looking for, for ancient knowledge. Now, when I read that, I immediately thought, that sounds like some privilege to me. <laughs> I mean, it's like 1902, 1906. You know what I'm going to do. Just going to travel and read old books. Come on now. So anyway, uh, he went to Egypt. Afghanistan, Greece, Iran, India, and Tibet. That's a lot of traveling. Why didn't Pimpin' All Over the World pop up in my head? I thought about the map on Indiana Jones where it like showed a little <laughs> line going across the globe. He was just like bouncing around. Like. <laughs> so anyway, my man, he was like, I got to find all the knowledge I can. He went to all the religious sites. He went to monasteries. Um, and so he encountered the symbol for the Enneagram. And then he went back to Russia and began teaching about the symbol. Um, He broke the symbol down into kind of three parts and he explained like the meaning of each. So there's like the circle, there's like a triangle and there's like this, I'll call it a squiggly line that looks kind of like a, the, the, uh, the EKG on on the heart monitor goes up and down. That's what it kind of looks like. Okay. So there's those three parts. um, And we'll, we'll link to some resources that like explain it in more detail because it's kind of visual. Like I can't really describe it over a podcast, like Mm -hmm. how they break out, but we'll, we'll put that in the, in the show notes. Okay. So that's the symbol, everyone. <laughs> Fast forward some more to the 1950s and Oscar Ichazo. Ichazo? Akazo? Ichazo? Ichazo? I'm not sure. Again. My um, bad. It's fine. <laughs> How would they know? Um, <laughs> he goes on a similar jer- journey as George Gorgiev. He went to Argentina and the Middle East. And on his travels, he actually discovered the link between the symbol and the nine personality test types. Excuse me. So wait. So George, George was out here teaching the symbol on vibes. But like Oscar actually made the connection as to like what it yeah, really meant. Yeah. Yeah. So he was like, yo, this symbol is like super dope. It, it like connects the universe. So it's like everything that that like from a f- philosophical standpoint, like traces back to these, like n- these, these shapes that are a part of the symbol and the nine different points that are on the circle. Mm. So he's just like, yo, it's some, it's some really deep meaning in this symbol. But then, uh, was it Oscar? Oscar. We're going to focus on Oscar. So Oscar, he was doing his studying and he read this book called the Enneads by Plotinus, who was this Greek philosopher born in Egypt. And so he studied that book, the Kabbalah. He looked at the Christian concepts of like the seven deadly sins and some other religious works. And then through what was described as like divine inspiration, basically, he saw the link between the symbol and the nine personality types. 
in that form what we like now know as the Enneagram. Mm. So anyway, that's a brief history. And we kind of just like summarized it really quick. It's a whole chapter in this book called The Wisdom of the Enneagram by Don Riso and Russ Hudson that kind of goes into like the very specifics of it. And they have like diagrams and they show you all the stuff. So uh, feel free to check that book out. We'll link it to the show notes. Um, but yeah, that's kind of a brief history. All right. So we get the symbol, we get the personality types, and the running theme is that there's this integration of religious practices with the foundation of the Enneagram. One of my favorite podcasts about the Enneagram was actually through a Christian tent, and it's really making the rounds, the Enneagram is, that is, is really making the rounds through mainstream Christian churches, which I actually found super interesting because like I said, when you see the symbol, you might be like, what? What is this? I think especially if you're not to be offensive, but if you're firmly in your Christian bag and like symbols and like other mystical type of things can be a little scary. And they actually talk about it on this podcast. The podcast is called the Enneacast. And so um, it's actually really interesting how all of these people that they have on their show are all super Christians in these churches. I don't think it's made its way to the black church yet. That's all I'm going to say. But (laughs) like they're having workshops and like pastors are teaching it and they're deciphering all of this divine wisdom from this symbol and the personality types. And to kind of bridge the gap to Christianity specifically, they believe that Jesus embodies all nine of the personality types, like all of the best characteristics of all nine personality types. And so they use that to teach each other how to work with each other and to learn more about themselves and like integrate scriptures and all kinds of things. So it's actually really interesting. But so in the fact that like the Kabbalah and and Mm -hmm. these other religious practices are integrated into that is actually really cool. Mm -hmm. It's always so amazing to me when we start digging into these things and these roots are so deep. And I think sometimes we can be very flippant about what people knew Mm -hmm. way back when. Yeah. Because we were like, you didn't have an iPad. Yeah. You didn't have virtual reality. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But like this, like, this like wealth of knowledge that's either been lost or wasn't passed down or maybe was before written word, which doesn't mean that it wasn't intelligent. It's Mm -hmm. just that motherfuckers weren't writing it down. So, (laughs) you know, I think that's just like, so like mind blowing to me. That I think that goes back to my point. I feel like they were probably recording this stuff or like talking about this stuff before it was recorded down, like you said, Mm -hmm. and Babylon just happened to like capture it all on the hard drive. Mm. You feel me? So like, not the hard drive is, you know, that's how we found out about a lot of this stuff, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> anyway, I think I got a whole, I got a whole, all, all kinds of theories about Babylon. So thinking back on our spiritual journey, I feel like what was interesting um, as we were starting to evolve our beliefs, we ran into the Enneagram first. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was, you know, I don't believe in coincidences. Um, I think what helped us to kind of step out and explore it more was because we found these resources that like still made it kind of like safe from like a Mm -hmm. a christian standpoint and and from our upbringing standpoint it met Uh, us where we were exactly exactly so um for for folks out there who are probably on a similar journey it could also be a way for you to kind of explore some things that are outside of the traditional box uh but still being kind of close to what you're used to Mm -hmm. so um let's talk a little bit about how you find out what type you are. Hey. Um, so you don't need your birth time. Uh, I know folks are probably stressing out in our birth oh, chart. my birth time! <laughs> in our birth chart uh, episode, we talked about that. But um, really, all you need is some self-awareness. So there are plenty of quizzes out there. Um, the book I mentioned, The Wisdom of the Enneagram, the writers actually have a website called the Enneagram Institute. Uh, and they actually have a test on the website that you can take um, that it does come with a, a a charge. There's a fee associated with it. I forgot how much it is. Um, but we actually think the best way is to go on their website and just kind of read through the shorter descriptions that they have on the site of each of the types and then kind of narrow down the three that you feel like are, you know, 
the closest to you. Uh, and then from there, read the longer descriptions. And I think when you're reading them, the longer descriptions, you'll hit one where it's like, yo, they read me. Like they're, they're really like getting to the depths of who I am, my soul. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like who, who who wrote this? Like, you know, like are they reading my diary? Um, and so that's the one. When you when you when you feel like they're reading you, that's the one that you know is is your number. Yeah. I would just also say that if you are torn between two numbers or multiple numbers, a great thing about the Enneagram Institute website that I love is that you can click through and it'll say like, oh, I think I'm a two or a nine. And there's like a link to like, if you're trying to choose between the both of them, this is what they have in common. But what really differentiates them is this one does this for this reason. And this one does that. And it'll really help you like really dig in because I do feel similarities to other types sometimes. Um, But when you like really dig into that, you're like, oh, okay. I can see where, I would act differently than that person. And then maybe this is this is my real type. Um, yeah, I think when we tell people about when we've told people about the Enneagram in the past, they're like, where's the quiz? And like people just like want to like click a couple buttons and it to spit out. But like we've seen it not be accurate. Yeah, we've seen people kind of put in, I think. And I maybe it's a lesson of like you're putting in what you think you are, but you're not really like sitting with it and you're trying to do it too quickly. I think our method, not only is it free, (laughs) but I think it really, really, really like can get to the core, your core number very, very quickly and like in a really true way. Because I've seen people say like, oh, I'm this number. And I was like, no, you're not, baby. (laughs) That ain't your number. (laughs) It's a tool for self-discovery. Why are you over here trying to type people? (laughs) I knew them. (laughs) I'm, I'm joking with you. I don't want nobody lying to themselves, okay? (laughs) Don't lie to me and don't lie to yourself. Anyways, let's jump into the type descriptions. The funny thing about the Enneagram is it actually starts with number two and it ends with number one. So it's actually divided into three different triads, the heart, head, and gut. And type two kicks off the three types in the heart triad, types two, three, and four. And so everything that's in the heart triad is governed by the heart. So type two, they're the helper. That's their name or moniker, whatever. The helper, the caring interpersonal type. They're generous, um, demonstrative, people pleasing, and they can be possessive. So this type looks like you'll burn yourself out taking care of others before getting to yourself. So when unhealthy a two can slip into doing things for others to need them. So I'm going to go out of my way to do this for you. So you'll be, um, you'll need me. So you'll like want me around, like you'll depend on me. That's when they're unhealthy. And we'll use those, the unhealthy and healthy a lot here. When they're healthy and like secure and, you know, doing the work, they can be very empathetic and warm with an unconditional love for others. A warning for women. <laughs> I heard this once on on that same podcast was that like a lot of women, maybe even Southern women, they're like, oh yeah, I'm a two. Like I'm helpful. And I think it's it's just like maybe a little bit of societal conditioning there. So don't necessarily fall into the trap of like just identifying with a two because there were things in there that that resonated with me, but that's not my type. So, you know, Read through the other ones if you think you're a two, and you might be right, but just a a little warning there to maybe proceed with caution. Some famous twos. Maya Angelou is a two. She's talked about like how she is in relationships and how she loves to be be there for her partner and see see the world through their eyes. From fiction, Hagrid from Harry Potter, who was always in some mess behind Harry. Okay, always in some mess. Remember when he kept that animal, that creature, and they got mad and he was over here just trying to help that creature? Anyways, also Pam from The Office, who was always in some mess behind Jim. There have been some commentary about whether or not Jim was actually a good partner. Why were we rooting for Jim and Pam when Jim was trash? But I got to go back and watch. I don't remember that. But, you know, was he really that trash? I think he kind of was. All right. He was like sneaky trash. All right. We'll rewatch. Maybe. I don't know. 
Type three, the achiever. They're success-oriented, pragmatic, adaptable, excelling, driven, and image conscious. So this type tends to be attractive and charming. Not everybody rushed to be a three, okay? Um, (laughs) Ambitious and energetic. Type threes can be very conscientious about status. So they might be on the Enneagram, not the Enneagram, on Instagram, excuse me. They might be on Instagram flexing. They love attention. They want to be admired. They want to impress others. When they're unhealthy, this can manifest as being like a workaholic or competitive. Like they, they're just striving for more success. Oh, you got this bag? I'm going to get this bag. You got this car? I'm going to get that car. At their best, though, they're role models that others can look up to. So some famous threes, Beyonce, Oprah, and Muhammad Ali. I would say, I don't know if Muhammad Ali was an unhealthy three, but he's like that quintessential three. It's like, I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. Look at me. I'm so pretty. You know, that's like, it's that's so three of him. I think Beyonce is <laughs> on the healthier side because she's not really like a flexor. She can get in that bag. When she starts rapping, though, she is a flexor. <laughs> um but yeah, but so I probably say all three of them are role models that others look up to. So that's type three. Type four, the individualist. They're sensitive, introspective, expressive. They can be dramatic, self-absorbed, and temperamental. These are the trendsetters. They usually have a style all their own, like they're wearing, you know, different fashions. They're putting together things. You're like, I would have never put that together, but that works. Type fours are emotionally honest, creative, and personal, but they could also be moody and self-conscious. So when they're unhealthy, they can actually have issues with self-pity, but at their best, they're highly creative people. So some famous fours, Rihanna, the fashions, okay? Prince, the fashions. Amy Winehouse, what was that on her head? But we liked it. Mm -hmm. The eyeliner, it worked. So when I first read about fours, the the first person I thought of is a fictional character. All my friends, all, all my folks out there who watch Doug, Doug's sister, the artsy, <laughs> kind of like didn't really want to be bothered with Doug because she was so different. Mm. Is that quintessential like misunderstood artist four? So that's what I thought of when I when I first read. It. She does give four. Yeah, she does give four. I think Doug is a little before my time. Then you calling me old. Maybe I just wanted to call myself young. Maybe I also didn't have cable growing up. But that's my business <laughs> that I just put out on the podcast. Anyways. So let's talk a little bit more about what that heart triad means. So those in the heart triad, they, they use their feelings to make decisions. Um, each triad kind of has like this emotion that they struggle with and kind of need to overcome and for the heart triad, that emotion is shame. 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 <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help it. All right. Uh, so so for the number twos, um, that sounded, anyway. Uh, <laughs> well, like doo-doo? <laughs> Grow up. <laughs> for the type twos, this looks like feeling unlovable. If someone doesn't, like, reciprocate their connection, this may then kind of send them into overdrive of, like, wanting to help and people please, um, even if that comes kind of at their own expense. Um, So a two should learn to express their needs and make their expectations known so those around them can, you know, better understand them. So I actually have a friend that's a two, and she told me about how... Um, for a for a coworker's birthday, she got them a gift, which I already thought was above and beyond. Like I'm coming to your little birthday lunch and I'm going back to work, okay? So she got them a gift, and when it was her birthday, they did not give her a gift, and it really, really bothered her. It really bothered her, and I was like, I mean, yeah, I guess I can see that, but you know, it's just mm-hmm. again better understanding each other. I, it that lack of reciprocation she was like oh okay so we're not as cool as i thought we were (laughs) um shout out to my mom i'm sure she's listening to the podcast she's a two um and she feels so bad if she sends you a birthday card and it don't get there by your birthday it's like it's like it just it's so offensive to who she is that she didn't get that in the mail fast enough 
to make it there on your birthday. And you know, like me, I I'm like, it's all good. Like I don't I don't really care about about cards. Like greeting cards just aren't really something that that does it for me. But my mom will just, you know, feel so bad if if it doesn't make it. See, yeah. and now shout out to Mixed Mom who's listening, like, why am I in it? <laughs> See how I get thrown in stuff? I mean, it's a good example of a two. So for a three who's learning to work through their shame, this looks like them feeling worthless if they didn't have, like, their achievements. They may lack self-confidence despite being successful. Uh, A lack of recognition can also be painful for them. Uh, So a three should just really learn to accept the failures that can come with life and to be self-confident despite the setbacks. Uh, They can also open their true selves to others, allowing themselves to be more vulnerable. Yeah, it's it's always easy to talk about the types and extremes, like the really unhealthy sides of a three. But I think when you see a three who's like striving for attention and it's like they they're putting on sometimes for for attention, some of the unhealthy threes that we that we know. Um, And I think what this is really saying is if no one recognizes me, everyone recognizes me for what I do. And so if I'm not doing anything, what am I being recognized for when they really need to sit and say, like, maybe people want to recognize me for who I am as a person. And so with the bravado and like, you know, look at this and look what I got and look at this award. But who are you? Who are you really? And so sometimes unhealthy threes can lack vulnerability and just like stripping that stripping those pieces of themselves away to like really show who they are to the to other person other people that they interact with um cool yeah and so then for fours um they may feel like they don't have personal significance in the lives of others because maybe they're perceived as dramatic or temperamental when they're really like being themselves so fours should try to be just equally supportive for others Um, as others are for them. Uh, They can work on navigating their emotions, practicing self-awareness, and minding what they say uh, so they don't say something that they may later regret. Hmm. Other ways that we can work on shame, clarify expectations with others, express our feelings, self-care, acknowledging hurtful moments from our past, and realizing and accepting your weaknesses and limitations. Cool. So next up is the head triad, and that that is types five, six, and seven. So type five, that is known as the investigator. The type fives are intense. They are the cerebral types. Fives are perceptive, innovative, secretive, and isolated. This type is very curious, and they are the nerds of the Enneagram. They can concentrate and focus on complex ideas and skills. They're also innovative and inventive. They can struggle with being eccentric and lonely, but at their best, they are visionaries and can see the world in an entirely new way. So some famous fives, Albert Einstein, Stephen Hawking, Bill Gates, even from fiction, Belle from Beauty and the Beast? Yeah, I, when I saw the famous fives, I was like, well, duh. <laughs> I love that, I mean, you had to get a lady in there, right? Unfortunately, it was um, a fictional character, but from one of my faves, um, even though Beast was wilding, but Belle always had her nose in a book, so. Okay. Um, type six, the loyalist. They are the committed security-oriented type. They are engaging, responsible, but can be anxious and suspicious. Sixes are reliable. They are hardworking, responsible, and trustworthy. They foresee problems, but can also be defensive and anxious. When unhealthy, they can be indecisive, but also reactive and rebellious. Uh, At their best, they're stable and self-reliant, acting with a ton of courage for themselves and others. Uh, So some famous sixes are Malcolm X and Richard Nixon, uh, Ron from Harry Potter, uh, and Dwight from The Office. 
are sixes. I don't know if I like Dwight from the office being a six. Because I'm a six. Um, he was hella prepared. He was, but he was also weird. So, I mean, I'm just, you know. Well, boo, I mean, <laughs> this is an exercise in what? Self-awareness. <laughs> so, anyway. um, I threw Richard Nixon in there, though, because he was paranoid AF. Like, he had all those tapes. I don't know much about Richard Nixon, so I was just like, I didn't, I didn't quite. I mean, I think he was an unhealthy six, obviously. But yeah. he was, like, paranoid. He was breaking into people's stuff. Like, he was... I think he was really focused on his own personal security. Like, mm. I'm going to make sure that I'm secure. Mm-hmm. So as Mick said, he is a six. A weird six. No, I'm just kidding. He is a six. My favorite six in the world. Mick, would you like to give your perspective on being a six? Um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of my sixness is what led me into prepping, right? I talked about that, I think, on, on our first episode. Um, I think where sixes can get in trouble sometimes is not living in the present. Mm. We can often be thinking about the future and what potentially could go wrong. Um, I see my dad is a six. And so I can see how his parenting style evolved from his nature as a six, right? Like he was just very like on top of like making sure everything was safe and wanting to make sure that like every like detail about where we were going to be and you know who we were going to be around he knew about and he like investigated the the, the scenario he was the dad that wanted to like is such and such his parents going to be there and I want to go inside and meet him and talk to him that kind of dad um cuz he wanted to make sure everything was safe so <laughs> i was like i don't know why we were talking about mixed parents today but I remember uh, when I was pregnant with our first, Mick stained and painted, per my request, this beautiful dresser for the baby's room um, because I could not be around the fumes. Um, and he did an amazing job. We were so excited to show them the, ba- the baby's room. And I'm still pregnant. OK, baby is not here. We don't have no kids yet. And um, his dad was over and I was like, oh, look, you know, Mick painted and stained this and it looks gorgeous. Didn't he do such a good job? And his dad doesn't say anything. He just starts shaking it, talking about, is it secured to the wall? <laughs> and that, that's it. That's what being a six in a nutshell is all about. It's not about the beauty. It's not about, you know, the functionality of having this dresser and how much space is in it for the baby. It's like, is it safe? Um, and so I think being raised by a six has helped me to dial back my instinctive sickness when it comes to parenting my own kids. Now, I'm still very much like safety this, safety that. Like, you know, I want to make sure that the car seats are installed properly. And I want to make sure that like we have the little like soft stuff on the fireplace. So if they fall or they're trying to walk, like they don't hurt themselves. So I'm definitely still there. But I think I've, I've, I've dialed it down from where things were, at least from my experience as a child. Yes. I mean, the kids are not in bubbles. Um, But as we get into my type, I'm obviously a little bit more go with the flow. And so sometimes I'm like, it'll be all right. And then something happens. You'd be like, see, I told you. (laughs) Yep. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So anyway, that's that's just a little snapshot into what it's like being a six and always worrying about possibilities that could potentially go wrong. And we talk about mindfulness and like being present. And I think we always talk about people like living in the past and regretting decisions, et cetera, et cetera. But I think this is a prime example of actually like being too far out into the future and you're not you're not in the now. Like you're just so like focused on your preps and preparing for every little thing that hasn't happened and thinking through every single scenario and conversation and et cetera, et cetera, that you're not even aware of what's around you. So, um, yeah. Um, So, I mean, it's part of the head triad. We're in our head too much uh, as sixes. Going into type seven, which is the last of the head triad, they are also called the enthusiasts. These folks are the busy, uh, variety-seeking type. They are spontaneous. They are versatile. They are scattered. uh, And they really just love to seek out and acquire different types of experiences. Uh, They're extroverted and optimistic. Um, while they can be playful and high spirited, they can become overextended and undisciplined. They have the worst FOMO, 
Um, always like, man, like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm trying to be there too. <laughs> um, and are constantly, they're just kind of seeking these exciting experiences. Um, and they can be distracted and, you know, just really exhausted by that constantly being on the go. Um, when they're unhealthy, they can have problems with impatience and impulsiveness. At their best, they focus their talents on worthwhile goals and become satisfied and joyous. So some famous sevens are Elton John, uh, Lil Nas X. Funny that they were both in a commercial together recently. <laughs> yeah. um, Peter Pan from Fiction, as well as Eddie Winslow from Family Matters. Yeah, Peter Pan not wanting to grow up. Wanting to go from thing to thing with his friends. So, I mean, we have a lot of folks who suffer from Peter Pan syndrome. That's a con- common thing. Where they don't want to grow up, they want to experience all the fun without having any of the adult responsibilities. I mean, but bills are bills, you know? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit more on the head triad. So those in the head triad, they use their head or how they think to make decisions. They can have what's called analysis paralysis and spend a lot of time turning decisions over and over and over in their heads before actually taking action. And what that's rooted in is this core emotion of fear. So for a five, this looks like fearing that they're going to look dumb or that they don't know what they're talking about. They're not knowledgeable. They literally sometimes don't want to express themselves about a subject if they don't feel that they have enough information yet. A five should make an intentional effort to get out of their head and build relationships with others. And I think it's, you know, you don't have to be able to write a thesis on a topic, but just be like, hey, I don't know enough about that yet. But my knee jerk reaction is this. For a six, fear has their imaginations running wild, like we talked about, thinking about every single scenario. This obviously can lead to anxiety and not a very full life. I mean, I think in it's unhealthy. It's like you could be a recluse and just never go anywhere because something could happen. Um, a six should learn to move forward with courage, which will help them gain courage as they continue calculating every risk around them. It's actually said that the that a healthy six is actually the most courageous out of all nine types because they deal with so much fear and anxiety and like thinking about the things that could go wrong that the simple act of them just going out and living is takes a huge amount of courage. So good for them. Finally, for a seven, their fear may cause them to rush into a decision that may seem like a quick fix for relieving their anxiety. So They also might rush into something thinking like, oh, I'll never be able to get this experience again. I should do this now. I should just do this now. Um, Which spontaneity can be like really exciting and make for a good story. Or you might just be a little bit too impulsive and end up $100,000 in credit card debt. I don't know. But you have to you have to watch that. This type actually can struggle with overindulgence and addiction if not careful. So Sevens should look for more structure to help their anxiety. So their spontaneity is more about just spicing up their life rather than leaving behind a trail of destruction. So some other ways that the head triad can combat fear. So identifying and naming your fears, practicing a routine, uh, but don't, you know, be OCD about it, but just kind of getting to this almost like a ritual practice of um Certain routines can be helpful. Um, Practicing curiosity. So really just going back to what it's like to be that curious kid and indulging in some things that just pique your interest. Um, Journaling. Uh, This is one that for me has been very, very helpful um, to just kind of write out, um, you know, just what I'm what I may be obsessed with about the future um, and just like letting it out on a page. Um, So it kind of goes back to that identifying and naming your fears. So if I can just kind of write some of those things down, it can be very helpful and therapeutic for me. Um, And then thinking about like other things that help me, the whole idea of having a routine or ritual. I think for me, what I do is I like to break my my task list into chunks. So, you know, you'll you'll look at a huge to do list and I think I'll get in my head about that huge to do list and it'll like overwhelm me. Um, But if I break it into like three tasks, 
and just like knock those three tasks out, it, it just feels much more manageable. And then I go back to my big list and I kind of break it into, again, smaller chunks. Um, it's just like a psychological tool that kind of helps me to to get out of my head and, and focus more on the task I'm trying to complete. Um, and then I kind of just use the mantras of I can only do one thing at a time and patience is a virtue for me. Mm. So those are helpful. Finally, the last three types are in the gut triad. So these are types eight, nine, and one. Type eight, the challenger, the powerful, dominant type. They're self-confident, decisive, willful, and can be confrontational. Eights are strong and assertive. They can be protective, straight shooters who can make decisions, but they can also be egocentric and domineering. They need to be in control of their environment, especially people. Sometimes they can come off as, like I said, confrontational and they can be intimidating. When they're unhealthy, eights can have issues with their tempers and with allowing themselves to be vulnerable. But at their best, they use their strength to improve others' lives and they can be heroic and inspiring. Some famous eights, Martin Luther King Jr. and Serena Williams, I would argue they're on the healthy side. Some unhealthy aides, Donald Trump, Saddam Hussein. Okay, and I can leave it at that. Um, Lots of politicians are actually in this bucket. So Kamala's an aide, Bernie Sanders an aide, um, AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, she's an aide, as well as Winston Churchill. Depending on where your politics fall, maybe you see what I'm saying. But um, yeah, there's it's it's it can be a mixed bag. Um. I wanted to just throw in um, one of my closest friends. He is an, an eight. Um, and one of the things about him and other eights that I've interacted with, um, they can be fiercely loyal. They can, um, you know, if if you're part of their tribe, they will really like be confrontational against folks who are outside of the tribe. So it's like they'll, they'll defend and, mm. and hold down their tribe. But if you're not a part of the their circle, like it's like, you know, they're ready to go to war, you know, and, and it could be the smallest thing um, that invites their their confrontation um, to, to kick in. But um, they're, they're just very, very loyal. Like mm. like my this friend in particular is just like, that's that's my dude. Like when, he, when it comes to like his friends, like he's like very much like, that's my boy. Like, don't say nothing about my boy. You know what I mean? <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that's my been my experience with AIDS. Yeah, I've witnessed or experienced something similar of. Being inside that circle and then finding myself outside that circle with an eight. And it was an interesting, uh, an interesting experience. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, type nine. The best type. No, I'm just kidding. The peacemaker. They're easygoing, self-effacing. They can be receptive, reassuring, agreeable, and complacent. Nines are accepting, trusting, and stable. They're usually creative, optimistic, and supportive, but they can be too willing to go along with others to keep the peace. What's most important is everything being harmonious and without conflict, but that can turn into them minimizing anything upsetting and getting stuck because motion would rock the boat. When unhealthy, they can have issues with inertia, literally like not moving, you don't move, being stuck in a rut, or stubbornness. At their best, they're all embracing and can bring people together and heal conflicts. Um, so, like we said, I'm a nine, uh, which is interesting when you were saying, like, at the beginning, when you read your type and it reads you back, and that's how you know it's your type. I did not want anyone to read that page. <laughs> I was like, we live in Russia now. That page, you can't see it. <laughs> it's gone. That's my business. Um, that that was um, an interesting experience. Like, it was very, like, figuring out my type and, like, really digging into that was affirming, yet so I felt so exposed. I felt so exposed and I felt like I finally, I just figured out who I was, how I appeared to others and everybody knew it all along. Mm -hmm. It was very uncomfortable for me. It was extremely uncomfortable for me because I think that a lot of the traits of a nine 
going with the flow, being peaceful, being harmonious. Those are all great things. But it's a two sided coin. Mm -hmm. And so there I think looking back, there were definitely people in my life who were like, oh, she she bends. If I need her to do this, she can do this. She's always helpful, you know, and that they may have taken advantage of that. And so it made me reassess how I show up at work, how I show up in my marriage, how I show up in friendship, how I show up as a as like a child of my an adult child of my parents. Like it made me reassess every single interaction that I have with people um, in a really like kind of mind blowing way. I don't know if everybody has that experience with the Enneagram. That was me. But <laughs> This kind of rocked my world. At the same time, when I did find out about the Enneagram, I think I was going into a period of I had just started therapy, actually found a therapist that I really liked. Some other things were happening. Some like interpersonal conflicts were happening. Super stressed at work. And it just like kicked off this whole time of self-discovery for me. Um, And I guess it kind of made sense, too. Like I was in my early 30s. Um, I had also just become a mom. So it was just like, you know, I think you spend your 20s like having fun and trying to figure you're trying to figure out who you are. And it is a lot of trial and error, I think, in your 20s. And then in your 30s, you're like, okay, now, wait a minute, I should have this figured out. Like, why are these things not going the way that I want them to go? And like, how can I handle some of this thing, some of these things better? So um, that kind of rocked my world a little bit. I think that um, as a nine, I I want everybody to be comfortable. I want everybody to be comfortable. I come from a blended family, so that's always an issue. <laughs> um, so trying to just make sure people are comfortable. And people love coming to our house. I think that's I'm fair. a very hospitable hostess. They love coming to our house. They feel comfortable. I'm trying to make them feel at ease. But sometimes it's at my expense. And I've had to realize that. And it's a constant, huge effort to express my needs and like say what I need. I think I I was listening to one podcast and was like, when they're really unhealthy, they can't even say what they like. Like, what do you like? What's your favorite food? And they'll be like, I I don't know. What do you like? And that's like, I think, super unhealthy because I know what my favorite food is. I know where <laughs> I want to go. I know where I'm about to eat it. But um, just saying like, hey, Mick, I really need you to wash the dishes tonight. Like, I'm too tired. Like, that is <sighs> like, it's like so much work. And it shouldn't be. Mm. Um so it's been um, an interesting experience. I think like sometimes I have to remind myself of the lessons that I've learned from being a nine. Um, but it's not all bad. I think I just focus on like the unhealthy parts of it and like what that meant for me. But at your core as a nine, you're the glue that keeps a lot of different people together. Like you're you're bringing people together and bringing them into a more harmonious state. That's how I look at it. That's me. I feel like that might have been like a little message in a bottle. Are you telling me to uh, wash the dishes tonight? Is that what you're... No, actually, okay. Mick washed the dishes the past two nights because I was feeling a little under the weather last night. And then I had to work the night before and I was super appreciative. And I actually didn't even need to ask you that. And thank you. Of course, no problem. Some famous nines. Mr. Rogers. <laughs> That's my boy, man. We go back. <laughs> Um, George W. Bush is actually in this in this list. And I know people are like, uh-uh, uh-uh. But you know what? Looking back, post 9-11, like, I think he, well, not post 9-11, really like from his presidency on, like his whole presidency, he really just kind of wanted to kick it. He wanted to like, he wanted it to be easy peasy. He wasn't trying to have no conflict. He was just trying to kick it. Like, this man was so laid back, he, like, choked on a pretzel on the couch, okay? So, like, (laughs) I could just, I feel like, I mean, we've been watching, like, documentaries and stuff when it was, like, the 20th anniversary of 9-11, and you could just see it in his eyes. He was like, fuck, why are y'all doing this to me? (laughs) (laughs) Um, So we're not going to talk about his policy decisions, but I think, like, he just really, um, he seems like a guy that just, like, wants everything to be chill. Barack Obama is actually also a nine. Um, 
So I can see that. I can see him like bringing different types of people together. Mm-hmm. Again, we're not going to talk about their foreign policy here, but um, I can see that for Barack. Last but not least, type one, the reformer, the rational, idealistic type. They're principled, purposeful, self-controlled, and they can be perfectionistic. Ones are very ethical. They have a really strong sense of right and wrong. They're teachers and advocates for change. They want to improve things, but they can be afraid of making a mistake. So they're well organized and they're super orderly and they try to maintain really high standards, but they can be critical and judgmental and they're always striving for perfection and everything is black and white. When unhealthy, they can be resentful and impatient, but at their best, they can be wise, realistic and noble. They can also be morally heroic. Um, To even out the playing field, my mother is a one. She doesn't want to admit it, but she is a one. (laughs) Um, and she has this strong, strong sense of justice. Like, that is not right. Like, (laughs) like when you tell her about somebody being wronged or something, she's like, that is not okay. That is not right. Um, and she could be very critical and perfectionistic, but I think what people don't understand about ones is when they are receiving all of that criticism, that person is actually equally critical of themselves. Like they they demand high standards of themselves. And so like even unhealthy, it can come out as like you're like, you need to do this. You need to do that. But they're also, you know, I've struggled with crippling perfectionism myself. It's like it can almost prevent you from doing anything if it's not absolutely perfect. So that's something that ones really, really have to watch out for. Some famous ones. Martha Stewart. Everything just so. (laughs) Michelle Obama is a one. Also in fiction. And these are pitch perfect. (laughs) Captain America, okay, and Ned Stark. Ned Stark lost his head. Spoiler alert. Lost (laughs) his head trying to be like, no, this is not right. Mm -hmm. This is not right. Honor. Honor. All all that good stuff. Duty, (laughs) baby. It's a cold world out here. Head gone. (laughs) Um, so finally the gut triad, um, we look at these different triads and the emotions that they have to deal with. Um, so for the, the gut triad, um, they use their instinct or their intuition to make decisions and they can really struggle with the emotion of anger. And so for an eight, anger can come up when approaching life like a competition, right? They're, they're very confrontational. Um, and so when you kind of approach life in that context, um, you know, it's it's not always the best way to kind of treat others uh, or deal with different opinions. Um, instead, eights really like explore being vulnerable and try to put their walls down uh, to really kind of ease and make kind of these misunderstandings more easy to to navigate. Um, for a nine, they while they are peacemakers uh, and they like to to use their their go with the flow nature it can really lead them to bottling up a lot of anger and resentment. Um, whether or not that anger ends up exploding later, um, you know, it can't take a mental toll on, on the nine to kind of have that anger present. And they should really try expressing their emotions and needs more often with those around them, uh, as well as practicing healthy boundaries. So let's talk about it. If anyone has watched Steven Universe. Okay. Sometimes I can be a Ruby. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> My little Ruby over there. So Ruby was like this small gym and they were just like, mm, they were just angry. Off. <laughs> they were just like a little like ball of rage. Or if you watch Solar Opposites, which is, I think is a deeper cut. Um, I could be a red Goobler. Mm-hmm. Oh, man, if y'all don't watch those shows, you should check them out. But, yeah, I think, like, when my anger... And I, and the way that it comes up for me in particular is, like, work is a perfect example. Hey, Jen, can you do this thing last minute? No problem. Okay, can you also look at this thing and this thing and this thing? Sure, no problem. And can you also do this by, like, tomorrow? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm like eight months pregnant and it's 1030 at night, but no problem. And then I'm just like, 
and I just like lose it. I don't lose it. Yeah, you have to be professional, but I lose it on Mick and just exactly. like going some rant. I end up getting the brunt of that. <laughs> now wait a minute. Let me clarify something. I'm not like Mick. Why did you leave a sock? No, I don't. I'm not angry at him. Don't make that face. Don't do that. Don't squint at me. I'm not angry at him, but I like really. I mean, it's like it's like the the tinder for the fire has already been cultivated i'm work. irritated yeah and then if i just do one little thing it's don't like, do that it's like poof. why the fuck you lying <laughs> why you always lying i'm not lying man oh my god that nine go out the window Stop. <laughs> i did ask him when we were working on this episode i was like do i explode and he was like yes <laughs> i don't think i explode Okay. Be well, actually, this is also something I've heard about nines. A lot of times nines bottle up their anger because they're scared of how angry they are. Mm. And they know that if it came out, it would just like scorch the earth. Like mm-hmm. we're burning everything down. And so you're still probably getting a tempered version of yeah. like when I <laughs> how I really feel inside. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because I'm not trying to rock the boat. Okay. Um, but yes, so practicing boundaries, um, and yeah, which is also very interesting because I think, I think, and I think for, for different people, different scenarios work better for them. Like, so I think like I can be better at practicing, I am better at practicing boundaries at work versus personal relationships Mm -hmm. because like you know i mean like i like them okay but like when it really comes down to it like you're not about to just put a whole bunch of work on me if i have other things that i have to do whether Mm -hmm. they're personal or other work priorities so um however i think corporate america is set up for us to have weaker boundaries it's like oh are you a team player i am I aming you at 1030 at night and for whatever reason you're on your computer because surely you're just like, I don't know, watching Netflix. So like, can you look at this agreement real quick? Like, no. F off. But anyways. um, Let me just wrap up with the ones. (laughs) (laughs) So they may feel angry with others' mistakes and flaws, right? Because they're like perfectionists, right? Um, And they can even be very angry with themselves for their own mistakes. So they'll have a lot of negative self-talk and be overly critical of their loved ones. Um, Instead, ones should really embrace the fact that they can make the world a better place with their insight uh, instead of their hostility. Mm. Um, I do want to say one thing about negative self-talk. Okay, go for it. I promise I won't get on a tangent. Tangent away, baby. I have struggled with negative self-talk in the past. And an occasion arose like a week or so ago where... That would have come up, but I, but like as hard as I wanted it to, it didn't. It was like, you're strong and you're resilient. And I was like, hell yeah. (laughs) I was like, wait a minute. Wait, because like, you know, you're usually it's like, oh, you didn't do this right. You should have done this better. And it was like, no, you've got this. And you're and it was like my inner voice was just like, you got it. So doing that work, I think like people, we talk about it all the time. Like, would you let a friend talk to you? I think like once you. It's easy to say, but like once you really start doing that work and like start cutting out the negative things that you say to yourself, you'll be amazed at like what your default will become. Mm -hmm. Other ways that those in the gut triad can conquer anger, recognizing their triggers, expressing your feelings using I statements like I felt like this when you did this, Um, realizing that not everything is personal analyzing what makes you angry. So like what, like what really grinds your gears is my favorite statement. Um, And I think, you you know, using I statements is always like an easier way to kind of uh, smooth the way to resolution with Mm -hmm. other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, It's a therapy tool. Yeah. And I think that we hear it all the time, but I think what the core of it is for me is what I found in conflicts is and conflict is good type nines conflict is good it 
creates change and evolution and makes us better people, like a, a healthy dose of conflict, um, is like people will bring something up and it's like, you did this and you did that and da da da, da and or they'll punish or they'll, um, you know, bring up something else. But like, what is at the core of it? And just like saying, hey, you know what? It really hurt me. That hurt mm. me. I was hurt when this happened. And you can say when you did this, that hurt me. That hurt my feelings. Yeah. And being okay with saying that because I think like that, that like you're vulnerable and you're, you're vulnerable, but you're mad at the person. So like just name what that emotion is. So as I was kind of looking over this episode and thinking through it, um, of course I was listening to some music and similarly, similar to how we were thinking through the chakras and rappers, I thought a little bit about the triads. Okay. And like the the heart, head, and gut. And I thought about how Jay-Z and Lil Wayne will just kind of go in the booth and start spitting their rhymes, right? They don't they don't write down anything. Made me feel like they were probably part of the gut triad. Mm. They just they're shooting from the hip, going with their gut. However, their their gut is telling them to to flow at the moment. They say Biggie was like that too, didn't they? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. But then I was thinking about like a Nas or like uh, J. Cole who like carefully write out in a notebook like exactly how their their rhymes are going to flow and that that's giving me very much like head triad. Mm-hmm. So for the heart triad, it's a little bit interesting. I was thinking about like who kind of writes with their like emotions and like with their heart and I was like Kanye? I mean, I feel like we fit in there. Yeah. Um, Maybe Drake is, yeah. is in there as well. Crying all the time. I don't know. It just kind of randomly came to me as I was thinking about these these different triads. Like, what do you think? Not to beat up on J. Cole, but let's beat up on J. Cole. Okay. I feel like he is in his head and thinks that it's a very logical decision for him to produce his own beats. And they are not good. And that's <laughs> what I'm going to say about that. Okay? Look, man, my man J. Cole went triple platinum with no features. So don't hate on his beats. Because he had a budget. He was over here like, well, you know, if I do it like this and I do it like that, then I can cut this cost. And if I just get on GarageBand and do a doom doom, then I can like cut that cost. And the beats were not beaten. Look, I'm not going to use our platform for J. Cole slander. I will. <laughs> I'm the villain. So anyway, I think um, I think it's interesting just like that different style of of writing and creating hip hop. And like, I have no idea what their Enneagram types are because I don't know them well enough. But I'm wondering if that has anything to do with like where they would fall in the Enneagram. No, I think it's interesting. Interesting. Should we do a po- uh, Instagram post on it? I'm with it. Okay. Let's do it. Cool. All right. So um, just kind of going back to those core emotions of shame, fear, and anger for each of those triads. Uh, if you guys are caught up on the podcast, we did a episode, episode 17, uh, on shadow work. Um, and so, you know, I think th- that those kind of core emotions really tie into this, this whole idea of like doing this inner shadow work. Uh, it can really help those different types to um, have a healthy relationship with some of those emotions that they that they struggle with um so just kind of like wrap things up you know it's fun to to figure out people's types and you know analyze each other a little bit uh hopefully gain some more understanding of each other um the enneagram is ultimately a tool for us to to better know ourselves uh it can be a real uh kind of catapult for us to be able to do some of that internal work so um Mm -hmm. you know i would focus your, your energy and your efforts into and, and really like the self-discovery piece of it mm-hmm. as opposed to like labeling other folks. Yes. Yes. Even though it's so fun. But you shouldn't, <laughs> you should worry about yourself. Um, I was going to make an airplane joke. Like put your mask on yourself before helping others. Okay. I like what you, okay. This is the tip of the iceberg for the Enneagram. Like the very tip of just like finding your core number. Like there's, so much and there's like so much like i feel like we've gone deep but yeah it's 
it's a black hole of ways that you can analyze this and learn more about yourself. And I'm not even going to list the other aspects because I think it would just be too overwhelming. Yeah, but yeah. it's definitely something that we'll We're come back do, and revisit. Yeah, we'll do another episode. Uh, maybe we'll bring in someone who like does Enneagram stuff for like a living or like, yeah. you know, it's like a, a passion of theirs. Because um, I think we we know enough to give you a one-on-one, but we're not like... Mm-hmm. In it, in it. Enneagram so. savants. Exactly. We exactly. are not. Exactly. So we'll link to the Enneagram Institute website, provide a link to the Wisdom of the Enneagram book. We hope you enjoy exploring your type. Mick has something special for us, a shit happens segment. Yeah, so it's been a while since um, we've done a shit happens uh, segment. And I wanted to do one, and this one isn't necessarily about a specific product, um, I've just been reading a lot about um, kind of the energy situation right now. Natural gas prices have been going up. There have been some concerns about natural gas supply in certain states, particularly in Texas, where we live. Um, and so as we head into the winter months, um, I, I'm just, you know, I'm a six. I'm concerned about folks being able to keep their homes warm. Um, and so in episode 11, if you haven't listened to that one, go back. Uh, we went over quite a few options for being able to power your home in situations where there might be an outage. Um, but I also want to just encourage y'all to start thinking about winterization. So, um, you know, temperatures are going to start dropping in a, a month or so. Um, so, you know, get you some insulation tape for your pipes. Um, consider getting a generator. I actually heard that some of the generators, like we recommended, like the um, like the Generac one, which is like the automatic home backup generator, that's like six month wait times to get some of those. Mm. Um, so maybe look at some of the portable options, um, and then also look at an electric space heater. If your um, home heat is run primarily on natural gas, and if there's some issue with natural gas supply, then that could affect your heating. So have something that runs on electricity that you can plug into the wall as like an alternative if you. Have a couple of nights where, you know, super, super cold and natural gas supplies are, are having an issue. So just make sure you're kind of diversified there um, when it comes to being able to, to heat your house. Yes. And we'll also put links to our episodes where we've covered some of these things because, God forbid, I mean, you don't have to live in Texas. But if you experience a freeze like we experienced earlier this year, you know, there's also food that comes into play, electricity, water. So all of these things that you need to be thinking about. So we will also link those in the show notes as well. So I'd probably recommend if you haven't listened to those episodes, definitely listen. If you have, you might want to revisit and just jot down um, kind of making your winterization plan. Um, because, child, we cannot be depending on this government <laughs> to make sure that our lights stay on. Anyways, as always, check out the show notes, start being real with yourself, and figure out your Enneagram type, get your winter plan together. Yeah, and if you have a question, please email us at chakrasandshotguns at gmail.com. Check out our website, chakrasandshotguns.com. Uh, and if you'd like to support us on Patreon, there's a link to that on our website as well. So... Thanks, guys. Namaste.